it's interesting to think about uh, the sort of surface between what the sort of uneducated viewer can bring to looking at a program versus what you need sort of an expert to explain. Mm -hmm. So like in the case of this, there is stuff about like what we were just talking about, how the random function works, how it uses you know, mm -hmm. floating point arithmetic versus uh, uh, integer arithmetic that someone wouldn't know unless they knew a bunch about how uh, the Commodore 64 worked. And then there's a whole other category of stuff that one could deduce even if one hadn't written programs before by just sort of looking at the line. Right. Um, and it seems interesting with, um, with computer programs especially because that range can vary a lot based on what sort of language you're using. Um, and I was thinking actually of the uh, there was an interactive fiction competition last year, mm -hmm. um, TwiftConf, yes, for yes. Twitter-sized um, programs, uh, where, for one thing, most people were writing programs that were using a gigantic library of interactive fiction stuff to build on top of. But then somebody sort of took that to an extreme of uh, including the entire original adventure as a uh, conclusion <laughs> and releasing that, um, which is sort of kind of pushed to an extreme of like what's happening sort of below that surface as opposed to on the surface because right. of you look at the output of that program and then look at the actual program as it was submitted, right. almost none of that is visible to you. Um, so uh, I don't know if this is turning into an actual question, but <laughs> uh, it just seems like it's interesting. It seems like maybe that surface is sort of more clear cut in this sort of analysis as opposed to something like um, analyzing a painting or something where you have that same sort of like expert versus surface distinction, but um, it's maybe more, um, there's maybe a, like a sharper line, I guess, in this kind of analysis. I don't know. Well, one thing I would note about this program is that it's it's really um, in every formulation of its existence, it's it's there to invite people to make modifications and learn more about the way the C64 functions. So it's not. I mean, whereas for instance, like a tip, like a demo scene production, you know, um, people in the demo scene maybe you know will just like look like. Um, uh, disassemble, you know, somebody's code and look at it or something. But you know, it, I mean, th those those are those are things that are really pretty opaque, to, except to those who are really um, insiders. Right? Now, uh, whereas this program is is specifically you know produced as an invitation to people to begin you know, messing with basic programming and understanding how the C64 works, um, and and I think that's a, that would be a I mean, there are things about different platforms, like when you create something in processing, by default, the code is you know, linked to the page where your applet is, right? So you may have written it in a hard to understand way or whatever else, but that's a feature of the platform that you know, um, by default it offers the code to people for them to look at and um, try to understand what you've done. Um, and you know, and then there's other, you know, and then enterprise computing systems often, you know, don't work with that type of openness or invitation, but they're just, you know, meant to provide you programs that will work that you should not look at. So. There's, in terms of that, this notion of um, kind of what's surface and what's below the surface in this program, where it, it appears like, well, maybe there's nothing below the surface, like it, it's so small, but we actually did a, a series of kind of reconstructions of the programs to really push the interpretation of it as a maze. Because you know, in the in the literature around it, it was kind of uh, it talked about as this maze demo. Here's this one line, maze generator, and so on. But you could also certainly interpret it as just a, a textile pattern, which for example, Casey Reese, who's involved in the project, isn't really interested in the mazeness of it. He sees it as like a textile. But I was really trying to push, okay, well what, you know, if this is, if we want to interpret this thing as a maze, well, first you need to stabilize it as like a screen full of maze. Because it doesn't much look like a maze when it's just constantly scrolling. And that turns out to be, uh, to have some surprising difficulties when moving from the, the one line program. And so, you know, the first thing you have to do is, of course, you know, introduce something like a finite loop instead of an infinite loop, and you get your four next in there, and that, and all of a sudden, like, oh, it's not fitting on one line anymore. And it's actually, you know, so it's interesting that it's easier to do something an infinite number of times than to do something a finite number of times. So that's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. Um, and then when you try to, completely fill the screen. And you, you know, there's 1,024 characters on a Commodore screen. And you go to 1,023, everything's fine. Hit that 1,024 and it scrolls to, <laughs> right, using print. Because that's actually underneath print 
it's it's it's, joint, char it, you know, it's char out. And char out is actually, when you look at the assembly line listing of it, there's this big assembly program that is being invoked that's doing all kinds of formatting stuff you don't necessarily want. And so then you start like, okay, I'm gonna directly poke video memory. Um, mm -hmm. And use uh, and so you know you start poking the characters. You poke two hundred five and two hundred six. They're not the forwards. They're not the left leaning and right leaning diagonals. It's a completely different character because mm -hmm. char out's also actually converting character codes to screen codes. The screen code for those characters is seventy seven and seventy eight. And so that and so all of a sudden. It's and like, if you do that, in, if you're trying to do that in assembly, you also find that <coughs> on unused squares of the screen character grid the character color is set to the background color. Mm. Yes. So you can poke characters there, but you can't see them. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I had yeah. To, yeah, yeah, you have to, even in, in poking and peeking in basic, you have yeah. to worry about uh, background and foreground uh, color. And, mm -hmm. and so there was all of a sudden a bunch of unexpected depth in print that's doing all that, where print seems like it feels atomic when you're looking at it here, right? There's nothing, and like, there is nothing to putting a character on the screen. Look at them, oh, well actually it turns out there's a huge amount to putting a character on the screen um, that uh, becomes revealed as you try to do these series of reconstructions. And that's, you know, yeah. one of the broader points of the book is kind of how can you do software studies by writing programs to mm -hmm. answer questions, right? That's, um, <coughs> do you find the analysis, because uh, most of the programs I saw were in script analysis compared to compiled languages. Is there something easier about a scripting language to do the study on rather than a compiled language? Is it just because it is more easily available? Well, or more right, I mean, two of them were in assembly, which isn't compiled, yeah, yeah. <laughs> strictly speaking. But um, uh, I mean, it's easier to make these type of modifications and see what happens if you have a language that has a uh, top level, whether it's uh, basic, Python, um, I mean, JavaScript is is to actually JavaScript is is not something you want to talk about too much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but if you want to use the error console to write like one line yeah. JavaScript programs, like that's not that's not a bad idea. If you take something like Java and then you have a um, something like Doctor Java that you use to um, you know as a top level that you're able to work with and. I, I, it's a, if, you, if the question is sort of like practically when you're studying no. these things, sort of like what what are good, what are you know, what yeah, are no, good facilities it, for that? I mean, a good ways I to go I guess part of it is um, mm -hmm. just the, you were talking about openness, and mm -hmm. by definition, a scripting language is more open because the program is given in a written form to the person who runs it, rather than yeah. a compiled like you know program is compiled. You can't. You can't see the sim you can't you can decompile it, but you will never really see what the person wrote to begin with unless you have their original source right. code. Um, yes. So but I mean one of the issues though is that even you know, you have a program like this. I mean I showed you one version of it that was from a print source. The version that I use uh, throughout is slightly different. Uh, the version that's in the Commodore sixty four uh, user's guide is different also. So um, there's so the idea of, for instance, what the person really wrote, I mean, we don't even know who the person is, mm -hmm. you know, um, much less do we sort of recover the manuscript that is the first, the first version of the program. And I think that's an issue, that can be, you know, equally an issue with, um, with programs that are written in scripting languages because the version that you may actually have may be quite a ways down the line. But it certainly doesn't help to, uh, to you know, to not have source. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, there's plenty. There are plenty of things you can do in a study without the source code to really try to understand things at the at the code level. I mean, just for instance, knowing something about what language the program is written in and what are standard programming practices for that language, and who, you know, is this person part of a uh, part of a particular community that works with this? You know, and it, it should it, it makes certain things more difficult. But it is not impossible um, to study things for which you don't have the source code and to study them at the code level. I just wonder, you know, in um, whenever this summer, there were a bunch of us who thought this looked like a maze. And then we started writing programs to, to determine whether or not it was a maze, right? Because it can look like a maze but not have a solution. Yes. And we had a sort of a whole exchange of 
computer programs which took this stuff as input, and then it was another piece of code that was more or less saying, yes, this is a maze, or no, it's yeah. not a maze, or here's what you'd have to do to make it a maze, or mm -hmm. um, so a kind of another layer of code, almost hermeneutic, hermeneutic code of interpretation, right? Yeah. First we're going to decide, okay, it is a maze, but no, this particular one, that one's not a maze. Um, I, I thought that was a methodologically kind of an interesting turn. Yeah. I mean, so I want Michael to speak to that, certainly, but the other thing I note about that is, right, people are, we're all just fine with using programs to um, assist us in programming, using static code checkers or compilers or, you know, th or, or like style comment programs, you know, and um, so it's, I mean, the idea that you would use a computer program on a computer program to learn something about it um, for the purpose of improving your programming practice and, and changing the program, I mean, that's, that's very, very common. That's hardly controversial, so why not? Um, also write programs that um, work on programs to analyze them um, and uh, in various, I mean, not simply to produce uh, software engineering metrics, although those may be very interesting in certain cases, but also to do other things like answer these, these questions of is it solvable? 